Welcome, everyone. How are you guys doing? Are you anticipating some good things? I hope so, because you're todad, tod, todad, tod. I'll leave the Hebrew words to my wife. I can never pronounce them. <laughs> Welcome to everyone joining us online. Thrilled to have you guys with us as well. God's going to do some amazing things this morning. As we continue in the series, Out of the Quiet, this was a series was birthed out of actually my wife's and my sabbatical this summer. It was a quiet time. A sabbatical is an extended time of just quiet, being with the Lord and rest, to reconnect with Him. And so out of that, we we're just sharing some of the things that the Lord did in our lives. And one of the things that the Lord used was this little book called Leading Me, which I know uh, almost all all of you in the room and maybe some of you watching online are I own this if you don't buy a copy before you leave here. We might have a couple copies left. Get a digital copy. Process this with us. The, the, the author, Steve Brown, talks about eight different principles that are critical for leading yourself. If you ever want to lead other people or influence other people, uh, you first have to lead yourself well. Um, otherwise, you'll lead people usually into an unhealthy place. And this week, as we look at week two, we're going to be talking about unhooking bungee cords, which is kind of the author's illustration that he uses, and I'll explain it a little bit. What he talks about is he said, let's imagine that I already get some bungee cords and hook them up to your belt or something like that right in front of me here. And I said, and I was holding on to one side, the hook to your belt on the other. And I said, now take a step away from me. On your first step, you might feel like a little bit of tension. I said, now take another step away from me. You would feel probably more tension. Now take a third step away from me. On the third step, you would probably feel complete tension. You probably wouldn't be able to move any further. You'd be concerned you're going to lose your pants or you're going to fly backward. And the whole point of the illustration is he's saying this is often what happens actually in our walk with God as well, is that we feel like, why am I, I'm trying to move forward in my walk with God. I'm trying to grow as an individual, yet I feel like I'm getting to a place where I feel stuck. And every once in a while, I even get yanked backward. And I feel like, why in the world does that happen? And I, I imagine that if all of us are honest here in this room, all of us at some point in our life have felt stuck. Maybe you felt stuck in your walk with God. Maybe you felt stuck in your relationship with somebody else, like always in conflict. Maybe you felt stuck in a cycle of sin or addiction. Maybe you felt stuck in a bad thought pattern. Maybe you felt stuck uh, in, in some other area of your life, but you probably at some point have felt stuck and you've wondered, why can't I move forward? Anyone ever felt that way? I have. You just feel stuck. And you wonder, how in the world do I unhook these bungee cords? Um, I was lucky enough this week to spend about an hour uh, video chatting with the author of uh, Leading Me. Apparently, you get stuff like that when you buy 500 of their books. So, <laughs> but I was asking Steve Brown, I said, so when you came to this chapter on bungee cords, what led you to kind of unpack these six bungee cords that you talk about in the chapter? And he said, listen, in my decade of working with pastors and Christian leaders, these are the top six that it always comes back to. So if this is what is really common among pastors and Christian leaders, I would imagine it's probably just pretty common in humanity, in all of us. That these are the things that uh, the enemy will often go after to try to hook us from being able to move forward in our walk with the Lord. And so he addresses six. I'm not going to address six this morning. I'm actually going to land on one. This week, uh, you and Jesus are going to have to walk through the other five on your own. And it's worth the walk. I can promise you that. Um, but the point of this week is to unhook these bungee cords that have been holding us back. And I imagine that all of us would say, yep, there's probably some places where I felt stuck or I felt like I keep getting pulled back in an area. And if I could get freedom, if I could unhook that thing, I would want to do that. Anyone else? Okay, good. A couple of us. The rest of you are going to get unhooked. You just don't know it yet. So I was praying and saying, God, what do you want uh, me to talk about this week? And I felt like he led me to... Uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I was thinking about trying to tackle chapter five, actually, um, where what Jesus is going to do is he's going to uh, address a whole bunch of areas where the Jewish crowd, they think they've actually got it together, but they unwillingly or unkind of knowingly are actually bungeed and they don't realize it. And so Jesus is going to say, hey, you think you got it all together? Like, don't murder. But there's this other thing called anger that's actually holding you back. You think you've got it all held together? Like, don't have an affair. But then there's this other thing called lust that's holding you back and bunging you. You think you've got it all together? And he does this in a handful of different uh, uh, 
areas. And I believe Jesus actually, he, he lays out a pretty strategic order to how to deal with uh, some of these things that hold us back in life. And he starts with one that I think is so critical. Critical. Um, it's these areas where we just think we can fly under the radar. We can let that one go. It's not that big of a deal, but it's actually huge that we deal with it and unhook it. So let's start in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. This is what Jesus is saying to the crowd who's with him. He says this, You've heard it said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, he's obviously he's quoting one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. If you murder, you're going to be subject to judgment. Everyone there is like, totally get that. Jesus, guess what? Haven't murdered anyone. Check. I'm good. And that's how people are thinking. Then he says this in verse 22, But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, which means empty-headed one, is answerable to court. And anyone who says, you fool, which was actually a pretty derogatory, uh, rude term to call someone a fool, will be in danger of fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. So it's like, hey, you're getting ready to worship the Lord, present an offering to the Lord. You realize that you've got something wrong with someone. You've got unforgiveness. You've got anger there. Drop it. Don't continue in your process of worshiping the Lord. Isn't that crazy? Stop. Stop the process. Before you go and worship the Lord, reconcile. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and do the worship thing and offer your gift to the Lord. Now, everyone agrees with verse 21. Don't murder. But then Jesus goes to this place of anger and all of a sudden everyone's guilty. Everyone's like, oh, uh, any of you guys ever been angry? (laughs) And all of a sudden, we're all guilty. Now here's why anger is actually connected with murder in the heart. I was listening this summer, basically what I did is I read this book, I read a lot of scripture, and I listened to about 30 hours of of this guy named Dallas Willard, who is actually a a brilliant Christian author, he's a philosopher, and his books are pretty hard to read, so since they're so hard to read, I listened to him instead. Um, (laughs) But uh, he was talking about anger, and he describes this anger, or anger is this way, anger is the will to harm, meaning if I had my will, Will, if I had my way, you would get hurt. That, that's anger. It's the will to harm, which is why when someone's angry at you, you already feel hurt, right? When someone's angry at you, you feel hurt inside because they had the will. If it, was there, if it was up to them, they would hurt you. Anger is always connected with my hurt, my wounds, and where I've been mistreated. I, I, Dallas Willard said this. I thought this was so insightful. Anger actually announces something. It announces that something needs to be dealt with and something needs to be changed in your life. He said this, anger is to the soul as pain is to the body. Anger is to the soul as pain is to the body. So when you stub your toe, your your brain goes, oh, you gotta tend to that stubbed toe. And in the same way, when we are angry, It is a type of pain. It's an emotional pain, but it's actually sending a signal to our hearts that something needs to be tended to, something needs to be dealt with. Unfortunately, what a lot of us have done is we've let this thing, like Jesus was talking about with the Israelites, you've let it fly under the radar, we've treated it like it's not a big deal, and we just keep going on with life, and we've missed this thing that anger is actually announcing something, and that is something's wrong in your life and needs to be tended to. Are you tracking? Okay. Dallas Willard goes on to say this, contempt and anger, and you almost always see the two uh, side by side in scripture. Contempt and anger are the two sides, of, are two sides of the same coin. He said, you'll always find the two of them in a beautiful embrace. Anger and contempt. If you're wondering what's, all right, what's contempt? If anger is the will to harm, contempt is this, regarding one as less worthy or worthless. So all of a sudden, I value this person less and when I have contempt, so I've, I've devalued them. So then uh, if you have contempt, you see them as worthy of harm or loss. So if you have contempt towards someone and something bad happens to them, you look at them and you go, ha ha, you deserve that. Why? Because I had will in my heart to harm them. And quite frankly, I've devalued them as a human and they're worth less than me. And I'm okay with harm coming to them. Are you tracking? So, why in the world does Jesus start with anger and contempt? Well, because I think everything flows out of anger and contempt. If I have the will to harm, 
and I have contempt, which is the devaluing really of, of other people. I see them as worthless or unworthy or worth less than me, then a lot of these other things just kind of flow from And Think about where Jesus goes next. He actually goes to this talking about adultery and then saying, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you're guilty of adultery in your heart. And you go, how are those two things connected? Here's, here's how. Folks, are you aware that in, you would not lust if you didn't have contempt? There would be no pornography if there wasn't anger and contempt in the world. Are you aware of that? You want to know why? Because... Pornography is the harm of an individual and it's the devaluing of, the dehumanizing of the individual. And everything that Jesus is gonna go through through the rest of chapter five all stems from this heart that actually devalues others and wills to harm them. And so this is why I think he starts here very strategically and he says, everything's gonna flow from here, folks. So if we get this thing right, all the other dominoes are gonna start to fall in the right order. Are, are, this is a good thing, right? So if you struggle actually with some of the other things in his list, like hating your enemy or, or lust, actually anger and contempt's a good place to start to get victory over those other things. Because when you get victory in that area, you actually raise the value of everyone else around you. You see them through the lens of how God sees them with this unconditional love and grace. Are, are you with me? Okay, so I'm not going to even dive into the rest of the passage because I actually tried to. I tried to write a message kind of going into the rest of it, and I kept getting stuck. And I was like, I couldn't get past this thing called anger and, and contempt and bitterness and unforgiveness. And I felt like the Lord just said, just stop here. Get this thing right. So this is what we're going to talk about. Whee! You excited? <clears throat> so why does Jesus start with anger? Why is it so important, and why do we have to deal with this? Um, in Ephesians chapter four, the apostle Paul is actually talking to the church in Ephesus and he's addressing anger as well. And he's talking about, here's why it's so dangerous, folks. He says this, I've read this to you many times before if you've been here at Lakeland, um, but he says this, in your anger, do not sin. Okay, so in your anger, do not sin. Are you aware you can have anger and not sin? Like anger is not the issue, it's how you handle your anger that is the issue. Jesus got angry, he just didn't sin in his anger. So how we respond in our anger, whether it leads us to contempt and bitterness and unforgiveness, or if we handle it correctly and we deal with it correctly, is what matters. And then he says this, don't let your, the sun go down on you while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. The Greek word there that gets translated as foothold literally can be translated as space or place. Don't give the devil space in your life or place in your life. Uh, I imagine it this way. If you remain angry, you actually indict, invite the devil into your space. If your life is a playground, you're inviting the devil over to play, and he will play. Any of you guys uh, kind of, protected of uh, protective of your own personal space bubble? You know, you know, we have kind of this unwritten rule, like, don't come into my bubble. <laughs> my kids do this, you know, when they're like in each other. They're like, he's breaking the imaginary line, you know, and they're like reaching over and things like that. And it's like, this is my space. My, it was funny, my wife, uh, a couple weeks ago, she was talking with someone. And you, in our culture, there's kind of an unwritten rule of here's how close you can be to me. And uh, apparently this individual was just kept coming into her personal space. So she just kind of takes a step back. And that person kept moving forward and they talked for 10 minutes and moved 10 feet. And have you ever been in a conversation like that where you find yourself moving because someone's coming into your, into your space? Now, what's crazy is we hate it when people come into our personal space, but m many of us here unwittingly are inviting the enemy into your personal space. You don't want someone who mildly annoys you in your personal space, but you're inviting the devil into that space. And it's actually beyond that. Not only do you invite the presence of the enemy to kind of play in your life, you actually chain yourself to the enemy. You, you're actually, you, it's like you go, hey, uh, well, there's a chain between me and you, and we put this little bike lock around it between the enemy and me, and he's locked into my space. I've often talked about this in the past, that the spiritual realm is actually very contractual. It's almost very legal in a sense. When you believe a lie in regards to anger, you sign a contract with the enemy. And he has to have a foothold to be inside of your space or to give him space within your life. Now, the beauty of the spiritual realm is that uh, spiritual contracts can be signed and dissolved instantaneously, praise Jesus. 
they can be signed and dissolved, and they're signed and dissolved based on your agreement with the lie or your agreement with the truth. So if you believe a lie, you actually partner with the lie, you sign a contract with the liar. But if you believe the truth, that contract is immediately dissolved and he no longer has space. Are, are you alive? Yeah. This is good. And the, and the liar that's connected with the lie loses its foothold. Now here's why it's important. Wherever there's a foothold in the spiritual realm, it will always even, eventually manifest in the physical realm. So if you have a, if the enemy has a foothold in your life in the spiritual realm, that will eventually manifest somehow in the physical realm. It can manifest in the obvious, like anger, explosive anger, maybe angry households as a, as a whole, or impatience, fear, anxiety, insecurity, unforgiveness, bitterness, stress, even in your health. It can be manifested in health. If I had time to tell stories, I would tell you about how actually freedom from unforgiveness it brings some, for some individuals that brought uh, physical healing. Uh, so question, is this for you? Is this for me? Uh, and how, might, how hard might I have to work at this? Is it for you and me? You betcha. How hard might we have to work at this? A lot. In fact, the disciples came to Jesus. Peter asked Jesus this question in regards to forgiveness because anger and bitterness and contempt and forgiveness, uh, they all kind of go together. Peter asked Jesus this question in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Pause there for a moment. So when Peter's asking, he's saying, listen, when someone wrongs me, I'm angry, I'm bitter, I'm frustrated, I forgive them. Aren't I awesome? How many times do I have to be awesome? Like seven times? Now in the Bible, anytime you see the number seven, seven is usually the number of completeness, okay? So when Peter is saying seven times, he's really saying, at that point, have I completed my task of forgiving them? And notice how Jesus responds. He says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or your Bible might translate it 70 times seven. Either translation is actually correct. Um, but the point of what Jesus is saying is, listen, when the numbers get that high, you want to know what is going to happen? Unless you're really meticulous, you are going to lose count. And when he uses the sevens in there, he's saying, I want you folks to completely lose count. That's how often, that's how much we have to work at this and stay after it. I want to read to you the Lord's Prayer. Actually, I want us to read this aloud. A lot of us grew up maybe going to church and saying the Lord's Prayer out loud. And maybe you just missed something that's so critically packaged right there in the Lord's Prayer. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This is where we're going to read it. It'll be on the screens here. So let's all read this out loud. Can we do this? Here we go. One, two, three. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Pause there. Now, uh, the Lord's Prayer is captured in multiple books of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, um, and Maybe if you said that, the Lord's Prayer growing up, and then you quoted one of the other Gospels, that says, for thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever, and amen, and we were done. But right here in the book of Matthew, the next verse, Jesus actually kind of expounds on the Lord's Prayer and what is packaged in there that's really critical. So verse 14, I want us to continue reading this out loud, okay? So this, let's go. Ready? One, two, three. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Whew. Now here's what's kind of crazy is there's a handful of you in the room that are reading that as if you've never read that before. And yet this is not the only place in scriptures that it says this. It's said many times over, your father will forgive you as you forgive others. It's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In the same measure that we offer grace, the Lord's going to offer grace back to us. Now you might say, God, the, how, how in the world can you give this type of expectation to us in regards to forgiveness? Here's how. Because he's saying, how can you not forgive someone in your life when they sin against you in this one area, when I forgive you when you sin against me in all the areas? 
How can you harbor bitterness toward an individual who hurt you in this one place, this one area, when I'm offering grace continually in all areas of your life? So I want you to follow my lead. It, you know, Jesus says, uh, we love because he first loved us. We, I would say we also forgive because he has forgiven us. So there's something that should be frightening and sobering when we, when we continue to not deal with our unforgiveness to others. Here's why it should be sobering. If you put Ephesians and the Lord's Prayer together, you would recognize this. Your unforgiveness keeps the enemy close and keeps God's grace far. Let me say it again. Your unforgiveness invites the enemy close within proximity to you and God's forgiveness and grace that he offers and forgiveness of sins, you just keep it at arm's length saying, I don't want it yet. So how in the world do we break the chains of anger and unforgiveness? Let me give you three ways. I'm gonna burn through these in three minutes. First one, if you're taking notes, write this. Surrender your will and trust to him. Surrender your will and trust in him. You don't have to have your way, folks. In Psalm chapter 37, verse uh, seven, David is talking about really his enemies and he says this in verse seven, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Don't fret, it leads only to evil doing. Earlier in the chapter, he says, commit all your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he'll do it. He'll take care of you. I, don't have to tr I, I have to trust in him and not my vengeance or not my need for justice. Second thing that you need to do is uh, practice thankfulness. Philippians chapter four, verse six through seven. It's a passage we've looked at before. Don't be anxious about anything. When you are angry, you're usually anxious. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayers and petitions. And a lot of us are like, okay, I can pray, I can petition the Lord. But then it says this, with thanksgiving. The with, the with thanksgiving is not like we pray, we petition, and then we do some thanksgiving stuff. It's when we pray and when we petition before the Lord, that is flavored with thanksgiving. So when we come before the Lord and we pray, we do it with this heart of thanksgiving. That's the flavor of it all. Okay, present your request to God. When you do this, then what are you gonna receive? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This is good news, right? So be thankful. You're like, what do I have to be thankful for? I'm so mad at that person. Start being thankful for who God is in spite of the fact of how you feel. Be thankful for his character. Be thankful that he's a just judge. Be, be thankful that he is good. Be thankful that he is with you. Be thankful that he can bring hope into the situation. Be thankful that his grace and love is available for you where you lack it. Those are simple ways that you can start being thankful. Third thing, look to the cross and the grace God have, has for the individual. The individual who hurts you, the individual you're mad at. In Acts chapter 13, verse 38, uh, Paul is actually sharing the gospel with uh, Jews and Gentiles, and the Jews are about to turn their back on him, actually. Verse 38, he says this, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Listen to this. Through him, everyone, everyone say everyone, Everyone, everyone say everyone, everyone, would that include the person who wounded you, hurt you, uh, abused you, wronged you? Everyone who believes is set free from every sin. The person who wounded you, hurt you, abused you, wronged you, that person is probably in bondage and they need freedom. And what you have to do is you've got to view the individual through their need of grace, forgiveness, and freedom. They need freedom. They need the cross. And you view them through the lens of the cross and what Jesus did for them. And it's when you look at them through that lens, it's really hard to maintain anger towards someone when you see their need for freedom. So this past, month, or this past uh, summer, before I went on sabbatical, I preached through uh, Matthew chapter five. And that week, I remember when I preached through it, I had more people come up to me and the number one thing that people said to me was they would tell me their whole story of everything that they'd gone through, the place where they were hurt and wounded and abused and whatever, and they would say, and at the end they would say, so you, now that you've heard that, surely you can understand why I don't have to forgive that person. I was actually, it was the number one thing that people came up to me talking to me about after the, I was dumbfounded. So many people so many Christians 
who are saying, I clearly, once you understand my situation, you'll understand why I am an exception to the rule. Because what I went through was so horrific. And I'm not trying to down how horrific what you've gone through is. But you're not an exception to the rule. And in fact, your unforgiveness keeps the devil close and God's grace far. What, what is the implications of an entire church if all of us harbor a little bit of unforgiveness toward a few individuals? The, well, the, the entire church is kind of st- will be stuck. We're bungeed from moving forward. Holy cow! What, what if there's a lot of us who actually need to be freed? freed? And I think that's true. I know it's true for me. In fact, heading into sabbatical, there were these things that I would find myself often praying for people who had hurt me, abandoned me, uh, left me, betrayed me all throughout my life and throughout ministry. And I would often pray for them because that's what the Bible tells me to do. The Bible says, okay, you pray for those who persecute you. You love your enemies. You bless those who, who are, uh, you know, attack you. And so every time I felt anger or contempt in my heart, I would pray for, for people. I'd pray for individuals. But here's the deal. Some people I prayed for every single day. And the Holy Spirit, he he told me, hey, Josh, is it possible that your prayer is actually your way of spiritualizing your anger? It's, It's your way of hiding behind. It's your way to, on a daily basis, revisit your anger and feel righteous in doing it. And so I realized heading into sabbatical, I was like, oh, no. I'm going to have to let people off the hook because this is an unhealthy pattern that I'm in. And so during sabbatical, I went away. I, I, I just went away to a cabin alone in the woods by myself. And I knew it was going to be a tough night. But it really wasn't that tough. It was actually freeing as I unhooked all these bungees. And I said, Holy Spirit, would you just reveal in my mind who are the people that I'm harboring bitterness to, unforgiveness toward, anger toward, And I just went person by person. I said, God, I just let them off the hook and I let myself off the hook. I forgive them. I leave them at the foot of the cross and I'm done. And what was surprising to me is that names flowed for about a half hour. (laughs) Of all the people, I didn't even realize I was harboring bitterness and anger to. And I was bungee to. And, um, and the Lord brought me a ton of freedom. And I feel like there's so many of us in this room who are actually harboring bitterness and unforgiveness toward individuals and you just have been flying under the radar. This is not a big deal. And Jesus is saying, like he said to the Israelites, this is a big deal. And you've got to have freedom. And so here's what I want to do. I'm just going to ask if we can... Um, Well, we're going to end with communion. And what sweeter way to end the service than go to the foot of the cross? Because it's through the lens of the cross that we can offer forgiveness. When we see the great love that God has for us, that he sent his son to lay down his life for us at the cross. It's, it's through that lens that we can offer forgiveness to those who have wounded us. Because God offers grace and forgiveness to us when we wounded him. We were guilty. You know, when we take communion, when we take the cup, it represents his blood that was poured out for us. And when we take the bread, it represents his body that was broken for us. It represents his great sacrifice that he made for us. And when we take it, we actually celebrate the victory over our brokenness. The victory that his death brought us at the cross. But before we get to communion, I feel like it's important that we actually (laughs) unhook some of these bungees. That we break the chain some of us are actually linked to right now in unforgiveness. And some of you have been linked to, uh, kind of chained to the enemy. He's got a foothold in your life. You've been carrying around kind of this chain for decades. Because some of you have unforgiveness toward maybe a parent or a sibling or a family member or a friend or someone or a bully from back in the day. And so I just want to do this. Uh, Can we all just bow our heads right now? I just want to ask the Holy Spirit to just reveal for each and every one of us here, if there is somebody in our lives that we need to forgive, that we thought perhaps we had forgiven, but um, we haven't. 
we haven't let them off the hook or, or somebody that we've been saying, uh, rationalizing in our heart, saying God clearly will allow me to remain angry to this person because of what they did to me. I deserve to maintain my anger. I deserve to be mad. And yet he's calling us to unshackle ourselves from unforgiveness and anger today. So just bring their, their mind, their face to the surface right now. Maybe we see a picture of them. Maybe we see their name. If the Lord has brought someone to your mind right now while your heads are bowed, would you just throw your hand up? Awesome. That's great. The whole congregation. <laughs> All right, you put your head, hands down. Here's why this is actually great. Are you ready? The Lord's going to bring freedom right now. He's going to bring freedom. For some of you, it's decades and decades. So here's how we're going to end. Would you all just stand with me? Let's stand together. We're going to be walking around. There's a lot of people that's going to be moving in this place, but here's how we're going to start. The first move that I want to encourage and invite all of you to make is actually to come on up here toward the front. We're going to have prayer partners around the front, and we're just going to break the, the agreements that we made with the enemy. We're going to break the unforgiveness that we've held, and in groups of like five. So our prayer partners, will you'll cluster in like a group of five, and they'll just lead you through a prayer. You're going to actually say out loud the person that you're going to forgive, and we are breaking right now, breaking the chains that the enemy has had over you. For some of you, for decades, the enemy is losing ground right now. Are you getting this? Are you, are you getting this? Then once you're done praying up here with our prayer partners and you break that agreement, you break that assignment, then you can head on back to communion. If you didn't have anyone come to the forefront of your mind, you can just go and grab communion. If you've never accepted the forgiveness that God offers and you wouldn't claim to be a Christian, but you want to put your faith in Jesus today, I'm actually just gonna be right over here off to the side and I would love to talk to you about what it means to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ and to accept forgiveness because when you accept forgiveness, you can offer forgiveness. So here we go. We're gonna start moving. Some of you need to start running to the front because you want freedom today in this place. Freedom. So let's, let's get this thing going. Worship team's gonna take us away here and we're gonna start the business with the Lord.